Welcome back everyone, this is Lemonade here for another draw through. So far we've been talking a lot about the main Sonic the Hedgehog games. Sonic 1, Sonic 2, Sonic CD, and Sonic 3 and Knuckles. Now as many of you already know, Sonic the Hedgehog was created to rival Nintendo's Mario. Sega wanted a face for their company, a mascot, and considering Sonic's longevity, looks like they succeeded. Sonic helped revolutionize Sega as a company and bring in quite a lot of profits, and of course when you end up with a cash cow that is Sonic the Hedgehog, you tend to milk it for all it's worth. That's what this video is going to be about. It's one of two parts discussing what I like to call the Sonic Oddballs. What I consider to be a Sonic Oddball is anything outside of the main Sonic series. Games like Sonic 1, Sonic 2, etc, etc. Basically, the games we've covered up to this point. But Sonic Oddballs are everything that stands outside of that, or are obscure enough that they don't garner as much attention as the main franchise games. And considering they made 28 games between Sonic's release and Sonic's reimagining in Sonic Adventure, there's a lot to talk about here. We're talking about games like the 8-bit versions of Sonic 1 and 2, Sonic Eraser, Wacku Wacku Sonic Patrol Car, Sega Sonic the Hedgehog, Sonic Drift 1 and 2, Tails and the Music Maker. You get the point. There are a lot of Sonic games to talk about, so let's divide this up into two different videos. And just because there's so much, I'm going to divide that even smaller into three different categories. The first category would be the games that were successful, or at least marginally successful. These games are fun to play, they're not much to write home about, but they're enjoyable. Next would be the specialty system games. Games that were not found on major consoles, like the Pico system, or Wacku Wacku Sonic Patrol Car, which was in itself a small kitty ride, in a way. Unfortunately, this was only released in Japan, but one day I'll find one. Finally, the last section of Sonic Oddballs, the last category, I would call the junk games. These are games that have hardly anything to do with Sonic, or just generally unpleasant to play. I'm looking at you, Sonic Eraser, <coughs> Sonic Spinball, although we'll get into that controversial opinion later. But first, let's talk about the good stuff. Sonic 1 and Sonic 2 for the Game Gear. These were 8-bit counterparts to the main series games, although they share very little in common other than downgraded versions of level aesthetics and music tracks. They also share some of the same names. In regards to Sonic the Hedgehog 1 on the Game Gear, it's very simple. It's very basic. I mean, it is, as I said, a downgraded version from 16-bit to 8-bit, so there's a lot less that the designers can do just because they're limited by technology. It feels like a Sonic the Hedgehog game, just with a little less power behind it obviously. Pacing-wise, there are these strange screen crawl segments that feel very unnatural to Sonic the Hedgehog. This kind of side-scrolling makes a comeback in Sonic 2 with the Sky Chase Zone, but in Sonic 2, it feels more of an appropriate paced segment. Up to that point, you've been experiencing the high-momentum style of Sonic the Hedgehog gameplay, so when you finally do arrive at Sky Chase Zone, it acts as a pause or a moment of reprieve before you venture into the final levels of the game. However, in the case of Sonic the Hedgehog 1 for Game Gear, this style of gameplay shows up in the bridges section of Sonic 1, and it just doesn't fit with the pacing of the game overall. As I said, Sonic 2, it was like a big rest before the giant sky fortress and death egg final moments, but here it just feels slow, sluggish, and not intuitive at all to the rest of the Sonic gameplay. But in the end, Sonic 1 was fun. It was simple, innocent in a strange way, and if you're playing through through the Sonic franchise from the very beginning to the very end, I'd say it's a good one to go for. Next, we have Sonic the Hedgehog 2 for the Master System and Game Gear. Strangely enough, the 8-bit version of Sonic 2 actually predates the 16-bit that was for the Sega Genesis, which means that it actually predates the Mecha Sonic from Sonic the Hedgehog 2, making this, as far as I can tell, the first ever in-game appearance of a true mechanized Sonic. I had a theory that a bad Nick from Sonic the Hedgehog 1, the rollers from Springyard Zone, because frankly when they're moving, especially with their red eyebrows and their blue spherical body, they look like Sonic rolled up, but if we forget the roller, Silver Sonic from Scrambled Egg Zone is basically the first time we ever see a mechanized Sonic that's a, a boss. But I'm getting ahead of myself as Scrambled Egg Zone is near the end of the game. So let's kind of break apart what Sonic 2 is like. Sonic 2 was made by a different company than Sonic 1 for the 8-bit systems, which explains why there's a bit of a different feel between the first and second games. The momentum of Sonic is a little different, and the types of challenges you face in Sonic 2 
to are a bit more surprise attack based, which, if I'm gonna be honest, I found kind of infuriating. I played it on the Sonic Gems collection as I don't have a Game Gear myself, and as it turns out, the Sonic 2 that's on Sonic Gems collection is one that gives the player an even more limited field of view than the traditional Sonic 2 making the surprise attacks frankly unfair because there would have been no way for you to be able to see them. Let's just say I'm glad that the quick save option in Sonic Gems Collection was a thing, or else I honestly doubt I'd be able to finish the whole game. Not because it would be too impossible, but the game is just lackluster enough to not really be worth the amount of effort it would take to complete it. Which ends up being a case with a lot of these Sonic oddballs. They're good, but if they get too hard, they're not really that good to elicit more playtime and more effort. Let's talk about the plot. The 8-bit Sonic 2 has a very different plot from the 16-bit. In the Game Gear version, Sonic has to rescue Tails, which is being held for ransom by Dr. Robotnik. In order to essentially win the game the proper way, Sonic has to collect six, not seven, but the original six Chaos Emeralds in order to rescue Tails. If you don't, Tails gets kidnapped and that's it. We don't really know what happens to him after that. Well, I mean, we do. We go back and we play the game again and get all six Chaos Emeralds. That way we can save our best friend. But all in all, Sonic 2 has some weird gimmicks like floating in bubbles and the hang gliding section, and it's a bit too difficult for its own good, but I'm glad I played it. I would definitely consider it to be one of the better made Sonic oddballs. Next, we have one of my personal favorites, Sega Sonic the Hedgehog, introducing Mighty the Armadillo and Ray the Flying Squirrel. While Mighty the Armadillo would make a handful of cameo appearances and also be a playable character in Chaotix, both he and Ray have not been seen in a Sonic game since, until recently with the release of Sonic Mania Plus, featuring Mighty and Ray as both playable characters, the first time since Sega Sonic the Hedgehog came out. Which seems odd to me, because the massive Sonic library of characters seems to be a selling point for the franchise, yet these characters haven't been seen since 1993. It took a fan game to bring them back. Regardless, I'm just happy they are back. Talking about the game specifically, it does kind of breach the category we have been discussing and moves into the specialty system games, as Sega Sonic the Hedgehog is an arcade game. This does explain why the graphics of Sega Sonic the Hedgehog are so clean. You can fit a lot more technology into a whole body of an arcade machine versus a console and especially a handheld. To move the characters in the game, instead of using a joystick, the players would actually spin a small ball that was installed in the arcade body. You and two other friends could play up to three characters. Sonic, Mighty, and Ray, just like a lot of classic arcade games. This may just be a personal thing, but I found the difficulty level of Sega Sonic the Hedgehog to be a bit higher than necessary, although my theory is that since being an arcade game, it's designed to take as many of your quarters as it possibly can. Thus, it has a higher difficulty, which makes sense. It's not to say that the game isn't fun, and it isn't enjoyable, or it's cheap. It does have that difficulty level of an arcade game, however. If you can find a way to play this game, I would highly suggest it. It's a lot of fun, very kinetic, very bright, just an overall enjoyable experience. It has a certain retro Japanese charm to it. Hearing the bit-crushed Yosh that Sonic exclaims when you select him as a character, and Dr. Robotnik yelling at you in angry Japanese from the top of the screen, it's just fun. It's enjoyable, and it's heartwarming. The gameplay is very escape-based. You're essentially running away from traps that Dr. Robotnik has laid for you the entire game, which makes sense with the rolly ball mechanic that the arcade system is built around. Next, we have Sonic Chaos. In Japan, this was known as Sonic and Tails. It feels very similar to Sonic 1 and Sonic 2 on the 8-bit systems. No real surprise there, especially since the company that made this game was the company that also made Sonic 2. The good news is that even though it is very similar to the first two games, Sonic and Tails slash Sonic Chaos does does have a few new features in it. Some of these features include the rocket shoes, which I thought were really fun, the pogo spring, as well as Tails is now playable for the first time in the 2-bit series. Depending on where you got this game, be it in Japan or for the Game Gear or the Master System, you may have seen that the game has different plots, technically. 
but after comparing the different storylines, I found that they are essentially the same. Sonic and Tails are chilling on South Island, which is the home of the six Chaos Emeralds. Something happens, and either one or all six of the Chaos Emeralds get either stolen or disappear into a different dimension, thus causing chaos in the world, and South Island is going to sink. In order to prevent this from happening, Sonic has to, guess what, collect the Chaos Emeralds before Dr. Ivo Robotnik, who shows up possessing the red Chaos Emerald. I mean, it is a Sonic game after all, this is kind of par for the course. If I had to compare Sonic 1 to Sonic 2 to Sonic Chaos, Sonic Chaos was the most fun. However, I would say that Sonic 2 for the 8-bit system stands out more than Sonic Chaos does. The aesthetics of Sonic Chaos are not as appealing as Sonic 2, not to mention Sonic 2 also has the first mechanized Sonic and the predecessor to the Sonic CD's Japanese soundtracks, Toot Toot Sonic Warrior. Sonic Chaos also has the Super Spin Dash, which was introduced in Sonic the Hedgehog 2, and he also has the Strike Dash to dash off at maximum speed. Sonic Chaos also allows you to fly as Tails, which would not be a playable option until Sonic the Hedgehog 3. As a quick aside, I didn't know that Tails flying was actually a named maneuver. Propeller flying, also Airman Tails, also Hella Tails, and also Propeller Flight, and sometimes just fly. Next, we have the Sonic Drift games. There's two of them, Sonic Drift 1 and Sonic Drift 2. I'm gonna try to keep this one a bit on the shorter side, as there's not really too much to talk about. It fits the mold for a lot of these racing type kart games from this time period. It's fun, it's simple, it's Sonic or whoever you pick versus other Sonic characters to a backdrop of old Sonic the Hedgehog levels, and <sighs> frankly that's about it. It's not a bad thing, it's just not something I feel like I need to talk about too much, because if you've played one of these kind of racing games, you've basically played them all. Next we have Sonic the Hedgehog Triple Trouble. This game is called Sonic and Tails 2 in Japan, making it the technical sequel to Sonic Chaos, or for them, Sonic and Tails, like we talked about earlier. Although the plot really doesn't have much to do with Sonic and Tails, it's basically a standalone game. Speaking of the plot, Dr. Robotnik somehow tricked Knuckles the Echidna once again into working for him. I'm starting to see where Sonic Boom may have got its character inspiration from with their version of Knuckles. Additionally, this is Knuckles' first appearance in a handheld game, and also the first appearance of Fang the Sniper, aka Knack the Weasel. He actually lives within the special stage, and tries to get his hands on the Chaos Emeralds to sell them, because apparently they're gonna be worth a lot of money. I never really knew what to make of Knack, I mean Fang the Weasel, I mean the Sniper. He flies around in his Marvelous Queen aero bike, and he uses a pop gun. He has a hat? That's cool, I guess. I like hats. The gameplay is basically the same as Sonic Chaos, just with a few new added features. The rocket shoes and pogo springs from Sonic Chaos return, but now there are propeller shoes, jet boards, hyper hella tails, and Tails actually gets a little underwater ship called the Sea Fox. It's very cute. It's basically so he doesn't have to rely on air bubbles. Wouldn't it be great if Sonic had that too? Just one last little note, Metal Sonic's in this one. Metal Sonic as from Sonic CD. He's in this one. This fight's par for the course, let's just say that. But I love me some Metal Sonic, so I'm happy he's here. Next we have Knuckles Chaotix, a game made in 1995 and published for the Sega 32X. This game had a mixed bag reception. When it was announced that Sega was making a Sonic game for the 32X system, they were very excited. After all this time only seeing Sonic in 16-bit and 8-bit, like we've been talking about, we finally get him in 32-bit. It was gonna be beautiful and glorious. And while Knuckles Chaotix is pretty, it still felt eerily similar to the marvelous work of the people who did Sonic 3 and Knuckles. It was different, but it wasn't that different. Now this game has a lot of new stuff in it. Not only does it have a completely different style of gameplay with the hold feature, where timing and team placement was crucial to navigate the level, it also introduced characters like Espio the Chameleon and Charmy the Bee and Vector the Crocodile, characters that would later become Team Chaotix in Sonic Heroes. It also reintroduced Marty the Armadillo, and it's a main series Sonic game that does not feature Sonic in the protagonist slot. Move over, Sonic. It's the red guy's turn. Heavy the Robot and Bomb also make their first appearance in this game, but this is the one and only time either of them showed up, so they're just kind of there. Like many other games that came from a Japanese audience to a Western audience, the story was also changed. 
In the Japanese version, a mysterious island appeared right after the events of Sonic & Knuckles. On the island, Dr. Robotnik found evidence of a long-lost civilization that had something to do with the Super Rings, which are the rings that appear at the end of levels to send you to special stages. The special ring created a space that was filled with Master Emerald Pillar Energy. This was crystallized into six Chaos Rings. Wanting to investigate further, Dr. Robotnik created Neutronic High Zone, aka the island resort that the game takes place in. Using that crystallized energy, he created Dark Rings for his machines. He then captured Mighty the Armadillo, Espio the Chameleon, Vector the Crocodile, and Charmy the Bee who were visiting the island. He placed them in the Combi Catcher, which was created by himself and Metal Sonic. Knuckles was also interested in the island to investigate the Master Emerald Pillar. He arrived just in time to save Espio the Chameleon from the Combi Catcher. The two join forces in order to stop Dr. Robotnik's evil plan. The plot for the Western release of this game is much, much simpler. There is a carnival island, apparently, and Knuckles is also the guardian of that, too. And Dr. Robotnik sees that there is a power emerald, not a chaos emerald, a power emerald, that is supplying the carnival island with power. And he wants that power, and so he goes and captures the whole lot into the combi catcher and knuckles shows up just in time to save espio and they figure out that they can use ring power which keeps two team members together like a rubber band and thus the game goes so a little less pizzazz in that story but essentially it's the same as far as the actual game is concerned it's fun in general it's nothing too spectacular which was kind of a bummer for the 32x as people were expecting something revolutionary with sonic the game drags more than most other sonic games i've ever played because the island is divided into five worlds each world has five levels with a boss at the end of the fifth level if you add the final Metal Sonic boss fight, that's 26 levels for a game. These aren't short levels either. Each Sonic game before this had roughly 13 to 16-ish zones or stages or whatever you want to call them per the entire game. In some cases, compared to other Sonic games, Knuckles Chaotix has twice the amount of levels. It is nice that there is a daytime change. It's very aesthetically pleasing, and the enemy difficulty and placement is different as the day progresses, but it's still not enough to remove that kind of repetitiveness that prevents you from enjoying the game as much as you could. Although the way this game did multiplayer was probably one of the best ways that a game like this could do multiplayer, as both players are controlling characters seen on screen at the same time. Not to mention that the ring power mechanic is basically made for multiplayer. All right, I've droned on long enough. It's time to tackle the last game in this section of the Sonic Oddballs, Sonic Labyrinth. I have a feeling I'm gonna get flack for this, but I actually did enjoy Sonic Labyrinth. I think it's because I also enjoyed Sonic 3D Blast, and the top-down isometric 3D in quotation marks style of it is very similar, so it makes sense. But the long and the short of it is that Sonic takes a nap. Dr. Robotnik replaces his trademark sneakers with speed down boots, thus removing Sonic the Hedgehog from his ability to run quickly and jump. Which, again, I say, I understand why people don't like, because it's basically what Sonic is all about. He does, however, see that it doesn't affect his spin dash. So, Sonic Labyrinth is essentially a maze puzzle game that requires you to find keys in order to progress through the levels in order to find the six Chaos Emeralds. Apparently, the speed down boots are powered using the Chaos Emerald energy, and the only thing to undo that are the Chaos Emeralds themselves. A lot of people didn't like the clunky controlling of the spin dash, and I have to admit, when I first played the game, I was pretty pissed, because Sonic just moves really, really slow. For, I mean, obvious reasons, it's supposed to move slow. But after I got control of the spin dash, the game moved quite well. You figured out puzzles, you explored the area, I had a good time playing it, and I know I'm probably one of very few that think that, and that's okay. We each come to these games expecting different things and getting different things out of them. But that's it for the first video of Sonic Oddballs. In the next episode, we'll be covering the other two categories in Sonic Oddballs, the specialty system games and the junk games. But hey-ho, it's been fun. Let me know down in the comments what game was your favorite out of the Sonic franchise that wasn't the main series, like Sonic 1, 2, CD, and 3 and Knuckles? I'm curious. But until next time, this is Lemonade, signing off.